I was talking with a ranger on shift the other day, and he had a strange story from a couple of years ago. The ranger, we'll call him Jacob, had been doing this for about 15 years, and he's seen more in that time here than I could ever hope to. Missing kids, murdered campers, lost people who just wander up out of the depths after being gone for decades, lost hikers who aren't as lost as we might think. We were talking about weird stuff in the park. I had told him about the train that I had encountered while looking for the kid, and he asked me if I'd seen any weird critters in the woods. I told him I had, filling him in on the thing about the butterflies and the other thing, before asking what sort of things he had seen. He got quiet for a minute as he thought about the best way to tell it. I almost thought he wasn't going to, but he seemed to decide on it after some quiet and leaned in close like he was afraid that someone would hear him. You know how far our property goes, right? Like damn near to the outskirts of Atlanta and then up to North Carolina. The park looks like a long, jagged scar on the map, and the park's size is really kind of daunting. There are some... 30 rangers to cover the whole park, which is why we end up calling in volunteers for large-scale searches. The saving grace is that a lot of it is dense woodland tracks, animal sanctuaries, spots too difficult to get to for your average hiker. The park that the guests see is a squirt in the bucket, and we have a hard time maintaining that. I nodded, not sure where he was going with this, but curious nonetheless. So one afternoon, as I was manning the phones at the station, I get a call about a vehicle that's parked along an access road near the northern edge. The second they told me the location, I knew this was going to be some weirdness. I tried to call a couple of rangers that were also on duty in the park, but none of them had their ears on, it seemed. In the end, I decided to go myself, and I found myself dreading the trip. I asked him why, and he looked at me like I was slow. It was the LK-76 access road. When I didn't immediately look startled, he rolled his eyes at me. God, you must be new. The LK-76 road is that road they had all the missing hikers on about ten years ago. There was a gathering in the woods near the access road. A bunch of hippie types with tents and stuff and the forestry service was out there for days trying to track them all down. It was one of the biggest incidents I was ever a part of, and some of those people are still missing to this day. There's about ten names still on that list as unfound, and I doubt we'll ever locate them. You know as well as I do that sometimes people go into those woods and just don't come back out. And this was a larger event than most in that respect. I tried to remember if I'd heard anything about that, and I decided it probably wasn't the kind of thing they put in the orientation packet. So there I am, driving an hour out to the spot in question, and I get there just as dusk is setting in. There's a minivan parked by the side of the dirt road, just like the report had said, and as I'm looking at the tag and calling it in, I see something glint off the metal and turn to see a fire in the woods. Not like a forest fire, but like a campfire off the road a ways. Looks to be less than a mile in, and if night hadn't been falling pretty damn quick, I would have probably never seen it. I decided to go check it out, thinking it was probably just the owner of the van, and come up on a familiar clearing that I haven't thought about in years. The last time I'd seen it, the place was full of tents and trash, people sitting around asking questions from park staff. Tonight, though, there was only a single fire burning in the pit. Young woman was sitting beside it, maybe thirty at the most, with a sleeping kid in her lap. The kid was school age, probably about nine, and she looked at me expectantly as I stepped close to her fire. Her expectation turned to surprise, however, and it appeared I wasn't who she was looking for. Oh, 
Sorry, I was expecting someone else, she said. Sorry to bother you, ma'am, I said, taking a seat by the fire. We had reports of a vehicle on the access road, and when I saw your fire, I thought it might belong to you. She nodded at me. It is. My son and I are just waiting for his father to join us. No need to worry about us. Looking around, I decided there might be several reasons to worry about them. It was August at the time, and she was in a simple dress and no shoes. The kid was wearing jeans and a t-shirt, though at least he had shoes on. There wasn't a sleeping bag or a tent in sight, and though the season was mild, it could still get down in the low 40s at night. I didn't see any coolers for food or water either, and unless the fellow she was waiting on was bringing a whole bunch of supplies, they were likely in for a bad time. She smiled when I told her that, stroking the kid's hair as he slept soundly against her. Not quite as prepared as I was the first time I camped here, but once his father arrives, I, I doubt we'll need much of anything. Have you camped out here before? I asked, the campfire casting her face in a ghostly refrain. Once, when I was very young, my family came out here to commune with nature and cut a little more than they bargained for. I sat for a moment, listening to the fire crackle, mulling over what she had said and guessing at the meaning. You don't mean you're here with those people, I asked. She looked up, her eyes turning a little hot. Those people were my family. At least they were back then, she added. The last like an afterthought, and it cooled some of the heat in those eyes. As I listened, I realized I had heard what he was talking about before. How could I have forgotten? It had been all over the news when I was in middle school, and it had been all anyone could talk about for weeks. It had excited a lot of people in the worst way possible in my semi-religious community. The news reports had called the group Satanists, but Mom and Dad had told us they were probably just people out doing crazy things in the woods. Ties to Satan or not, a bunch of them had gone missing, and the ones that had come out of the woods hadn't been right. They claimed they had seen things, things they couldn't quite explain, and for two weeks there had been general panic around whatever they had seen and whatever they had been doing out in the woods. I wanted to ask her to tell me what had happened, but it seemed rude at the time. How do you just ask someone to explain to you about what was probably one of the worst days of their life? Turned out I didn't have to ask, as we sat there listening to the fire. She just began talking, uninvited. He had taken me out of my thoughts when he started talking, and I focused my attention back on him. Our leader had brought us out to the woods to be with nature, but... He actually meant to commune with something else. We didn't know that he had been researching local legends and had decided that whatever was in the woods was worth seeking. He wanted us to be safe, though. He wasn't a complete fool, so he enlisted the help of a local guide. The kid, at the time he was only a little older than I was, came well vetted but turned out to be a little green. He set up what he believed was a proper protective circle, burnt the right things to keep whatever might come at bay, but it was all for nothing. She then looked down at the kid sleeping on her lap as she stroked his hair. I, I can't lay it all at his feet, I suppose. We did our part as well. Amadeus had whipped them into a frenzy with a mixture of drugs and alcohol, and... When we got what we wanted, we decided to get nosy. We went to investigate, despite the advice of the guide, and ended up unmaking all of his preparations. With the protection unmade, he decided to wash his hands of us, and went to go protect himself instead. I went to try and help my friends and family, but that's when I met this one's father. She stopped long enough for me to think she wouldn't go on. 
and when she started again, it was a little surprising. I remember jumping as if struck, her voice older than her thirty years, and wondered if I wanted to know the end. He met several members of my family that night, but to three of us, he left little gifts. Gifts like this one, she said, as she looked down at the sleeping boy. Gifts that killed the other two, but not me for some reason. Is that why you're out here? I asked. She nodded. He's been calling to the boy, telling him things that he can't understand, telling him things that he doesn't want to understand. It was inevitable that he would call him back. So now we've come to see it through. We were quiet for a little while, but all at once it began to sound like something was moving in the woods. It was big, whatever it was, and I began to hear noises that didn't make a lot of sense. The grunts of deer, the soft chuffing of bears, the clittering sound of raccoons, the chirping of squirrels, and all of it seemed to swirl around us like an angry wind. I whipped my head about as if I might keep it at bay with the knowledge that I could see it, but the woman had no such idea. She just sat and stroked her child, looking as if this was what she had expected to find. It appears that he has found us. I would suggest you leave, if you ever intend to leave again. If my van is still there tomorrow, go ahead and have it towed. I don't think I'll be needing it. Not where I'm going. I didn't need any more prompting than that. I ran out of that clearing, heading in the direction I believe the road to be. Behind me, the fire went out, and I heard those noises converge on that clearing, like waves rolling up to the shore. Fortunately for me, I had been correct. I came out on the road about 30 minutes later, and after getting in my truck, I drove like the devil himself was behind me. I got a call three days later to let me know the van was still out there, and I told them to call the wrecker and have it towed back to the city. Whoever she was, she wasn't going to need it anymore. The two of us sat there as his story came to a close, and I suddenly felt as if my forest train was nothing more special than a tree full of newborn squirrels. It's best to remember, strange things happen in these woods. You could try to rack your brain over it, like I did with the woman and her campfire, but it'll never lead you to anything. It's best to just put it out of your mind and go about your business. Otherwise, you might become whatever it is as business in the end. He left then, getting in his car and driving home. And after locking up the ranger station for the night, I did the same. I've got more stories from my first year as a park ranger, and maybe I'll tell you if the park service doesn't shut me down. Till then, take care of yourselves while you're out in the woods. Treat them with respect, because they will not hold the same respect for you. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead, Unicorn Hollow, and Army Dude for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton contributors. And thanks to Osnap, Hi Stacy, Winter, 
Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, Grim Reaper, Tom Boytop, Uwu, and Queen Sheba for being our Ghostly Reader tier contributors. And a big thanks to Scott Donahue for being our Ghostly Writer tier contributor. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you'd like to support the channel, then come on down to Patreon or become a member on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton tier contributors, that's our $5 tier, get their spooky 12 hours early at 8.30 a.m. as opposed to 8.30 p.m. My time, of course. And while Ghostly Reading is uh, only a tier that's available on Patreon, you get a signed copy of my book anytime I write one on your doorstep in hopefully a timely manner. If you'd like a book, we have many on Amazon. I've got links below if you'd like to follow those. Um, should get you to my page so you can buy any one of my eight books I believe we're up to now. I'm sure they'd look really nice on your shelf, and I'll sign them for you if you can find me out in the wild. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.